Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Worship for this Palm Sunday, the 28th of March, 2021, for the Nid Valley Circuit. A very warm welcome, whether you're joining us uh, from within our circuit or from beyond. It's great to be together. Just to say uh, at the start of our service today that uh, we've produced uh, a programme uh, of events for Holy Week and Easter uh, that's gone out with our weekly notices from the circuit. If you haven't received this and would like to do so, please do contact Juliana in our circuit office and we'll make sure uh, that the information gets to you as soon as possible. Also to say that today we are syndicating the district service from the Yorkshire North and East District uh, and we'll be joining our friends from there shortly. And a reminder as always to think about your offering and what you are giving to the church where you belong. Throughout Lent we've begun our services uh, by journeying together at the foot of the Lent cross and today is no different. So let's begin there now. On this sixth Sunday in Lent, we attach palms to the Lenten cross. What kind of king is this? Mark 11, verses 8 to 10. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let us pray. In this most holy of weeks, help us to stay close to Jesus, that we may recognise the unfolding work of God. Amen. <laughs> A warm welcome to this district service for Palm Sunday. Today this online service takes a different form, providing a series of five reflections on the events of Holy Week. After each reflection, there will be a short period when we can think about what we have heard and seen and bring our own thoughts to God. First, we still ourselves and prepare to worship God. Our call to worship. Jesus, you roared into Jerusalem on a colt, a symbol that you came in peace. May we know your peace as we bring our praises and prayers to you this morning. Amen.
11, verses 7 to 10. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. I love Passover time, the ceremonies and the special food and all the excitement. I'm Miriam and I live in Bethany, a village outside Jerusalem. <laughs> it's a real dump. Nothing ever happens there. We go to the city for fun. Life is really buzzing there because people come from all over the world to celebrate Passover. You'll never know what you'll see next. That's where I'm going with my friends and we're nearly there now. I can see the walls of the great temple gleaming in the sunshine. It's very noisy ahead. People are pulling palm branches down from the trees and waving them around as they shout and sing. It looks like fun, so we do the same. But what are we supposed to be shouting? Oh, I can just make it out now. They're shouting, Hosanna, save us. And now we're all throwing our branches down on the ground in front of the man on a colt. We scream with excitement. Who is he? We whispered to each other. He must be a celebrity. But no, look, it's Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. He's great, of course, and we love him to bits. But he can't be that important because we know him. He's our friend. You know, I said nothing ever happens in Bethany. It's not quite true, to be fair. Whenever Jesus visits his friends, Mary and Martha, Things happen. He tells us things that make us see the world in a different way. He heals people from their sadnesses and illnesses. He changes everything. That's probably why there are so many people following him into Jerusalem. They want to see what he'll say and do next. And they're shouting, save us, because, well, we've all got problems, right? <laughs> Those Romans, for one thing, wandering around as if they, not God, own the place. We need a new leader to sort things out. Even on a cult, Jesus looks sort of king-like. Perhaps people think he's the man for the job and that's why they're so excited and happy. Not everyone is though. Those Pharisees look like they've lost an egg and found a scorpion. Yeah, things could get nasty. I think we'd better go home. Let us pray. If I had been there as you rode into Jerusalem, I would have waved a palm branch and shouted my praise. But would I also have been puzzled by what you were doing, wondered why you were riding a colt, making yourself look slightly ridiculous, and why you allowed the crowd to make such a fuss, so unlike you, but that is one of the reasons I love you. You are unpredictable. You do the unexpected, forcing me to think again. 
You change the ways I see the world. You change my view of myself. Through you I see God differently. In you I can find the truth. And for that I love you. Amen. Mark 11 verses 15 to 17. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations but you have made it a den of robbers it was a very busy day but it's always like that in the run-up to passover i had a good spot for my stall and even in the quiet times made good money the festivals were the icing on the cake. Then of course we got the strangers coming to the city. The country folk with thick accents, foreigners speaking God knows what languages. They were easy to confuse and palm them off with the weaker birds. The disturbance began just before midday. To begin with I took no notice. I was dealing with a couple who were being a bit fussy about the colour of the doves and there were two more waiting getting impatient. It wasn't that unusual to get someone kicking off causing trouble claiming they'd been cheated but then I saw that this was more serious. People were running past eager to get out of the gate. My customers were pushed aside one almost upset my stall. Here watch it I shouted. Then I saw that there were lambs on the loose and doves were flying overhead. Eventually, the crowd thinned and I could see across the courtyard to the cause of the disturbance. Just one man, but he was clearly furious. He grabbed the edge of old Isaiah's table and turned it over, would you believe? The carefully stacked coins spilled out onto the ground with a clatter, rolling away in all directions. I saw some of the crowd picking them up and well, making off with them. Then the man who was causing the chaos turned and calmed himself looked straight at me and shouted, This is a house of prayer. You have made it a robber's den. That made me think. The priests were content to have our stalls in the court of the Gentiles. They made money from us traders and it did not stop us worshipping. We still had the other courtyards. But this man clearly had a different view. He wanted the whole of the temple to be a place of prayer. A place where even foreigners could relate to God. Was that right? After all, it was our temple for the worship of our God. Surely foreigners had their own gods, their own places of worship. Why should they be allowed to use ours? Let us build a house where love can 
and wealth and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how God's land to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Hear the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true. To dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as a witness and the symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome. Build a house where love is found in water, wine and wheat. A banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. In the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ the feast that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the to hear and strengthen, serve and teach, and live the word they know. In the outcast and the stranger, bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome. This house proclaim from floor to rafter. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Mark 14 verses 17 to 19. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, 
one after another. Surely, not I. We were like a family, certainly a band of brothers, with Jesus at our head. And I've been looking forward to sharing the family meal of Passover with him and the other disciples, to having a happy get-together, and of course, celebrating God's providence and saving care for his people. The table was set, the food was ready, the wine gleamed in our goblets, the bread fresh and fragrant, the special elements for the remembrance of Passover were there. We took our places. All was prepared and we had gladly accepted our invitation to the feast. But, on this particular occasion, as you sometimes find at family get-togethers, there was an uncertain feeling of tension in the air. Possibly we were all on edge after listening unwillingly to Jesus teaching about what the future held for him and for us. And then he turned and said to us all, One of you will betray me. The bond of trust we had in one another crumbled into suspicion. I looked at my brothers. Could any of these men with whom I had spent the last three mind-blowing years stoop so low as to betray the teacher? But then my suspicion of them turned into self-doubt. I had never felt worthy or special enough to be one of the twelve. My understanding of Jesus and his message, my trust in God, my commitment to the way, these had all failed me at times. And so I asked, as much of myself as of Jesus, Is it I, Lord? Do you mean me? Let us pray. Jesus, as we journey through the events of Holy Week with you, we see your suffering and pain. Also all human weakness, our weakness, our fears and anxiety that lead us to betrayal, our ideas of power and glory that allow injustice, our wish to shift the blame from ourselves and deny our responsibility. Jesus, as we journey with you, may we see your willingness to forgive humanity, to heal and to restore. And may we find new life with you. Amen. Mark 14, verses 60 to 62. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven.
The council did not normally meet this late into the evening, and some of the more pedantic members had already complained that our actions might be considered illegal. But time was short. The Passover was approaching, and unless we could find him guilty, he would be free to stir up the people during the festival, and then we'd be in trouble. I had heard the reports of his teaching, of the supposed healings, but this was the first time I had seen him, and he was impressive. Up until then, I'd thought all these wandering preachers were much the same. Dirty, badly dressed, with a crowd of uneducated followers. Oh, they pretended to teach the law, to bring people back to the right way, but they were really in it for themselves, wanting to be loved by the crowd. They normally came unstuck soon enough. But the news from Galilee had suggested that this one was different. One or two of my colleagues spoke up for him, but I could see that his teaching threatened those of us who are the true leaders, the ones who know what's best for the nation, who know how to handle the Romans. The reports had worried me, and I now saw why. He had real presence standing insolently silent before my council. And he had good reason to stay silent. We couldn't find the evidence. Oh, there'd been plenty of witnesses, but none of them were convincing. And just when we thought that we had what we needed, the next one would contradict. I was becoming desperate. So, I decided to challenge him. And it worked. I asked him straight, are you the Messiah? And we got what we needed. Blasphemy from his own lips. I was triumphant. We did not need the witnesses. But in the days that followed, I was unsettled by doubts. There had been a steadiness, a certainty, as he said the words that he must have known would condemn him. That was disconcerting. Why had he spoken? He could just have kept quiet and we would have had to let him go. I knew he could not be the Messiah that we were expecting, but could our ideas of the Messiah be wrong? Yeah. 
Mark 15 verses 33 to 39. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lima Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait! Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him, saw that in this way he had breathed his last. He said, Truly, this man was God's son. It wasn't my only time on crucifixion duty that day, but it was certainly the strangest. Not a popular duty amongst the men. It's easier to come to terms with life and death on the battleground than watching civilians being tortured to death. But law and order must be maintained. You never know how the crowds might react in circumstances like these. Who would have thought this Jesus character would have ended up on a cross anyway? From what I'd gathered about him, he was a popular teacher and healer, a good man. But the crowds in Jerusalem are very volatile at this time of year. People were passing by him all the time, mocking him. That's what happens when people get disillusioned with their heroes. Some religious leaders were also there ridiculing him. I did wonder if they were insulting him for our benefit to say, look, we're not anything to do with this man. But it left a nasty taste in my mouth all the same. A few women watched on, distraught, from a distance. At least they seemed genuinely sad to see him dying. We Romans believe that our lives can be judged only by including how good an exit we make. A good death, we call it. And it's rather difficult to achieve when you're being crucified. Jesus held up pretty well until near the end. But his last cry to his God was one of despair. Who could blame him? Meanwhile, something else was going on. The atmosphere was charged with a strange power. The sky went really dark. And later, I heard that the great curtain in the holy temple had split from top to bottom at the exact time of his death. The witnesses at the cross didn't know what to make of what was happening or, or who this man was. So, who was he? I often ask myself that, but from what I experienced that Friday afternoon, his manner of dying and the reactions of those who were there, I believe that this was no ordinary man. He embodied something 
of the divine. Let us pray. I stand at the foot of the cross and am grateful. Grateful for your willingness to suffer so that I can begin to understand God's love. Grateful for your pain that begins to release me from my pain. Grateful for your death that speaks of life beyond this world. And as I stand, wondering at the depth of this love, I bring all who are in need. I only see a small part of this world's suffering, but you embrace it all. I only understand some of this world's injustice, but you know it all. I can only feel some of this world's pain, but you hold it all. For the depth of your suffering, your pain, your death, I am grateful. For the depth of God's love, I am grateful. Amen. And now the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and for ever. Amen.
Our hope and prayer is that God will have spoken to you through the service. We conclude with our blessing. May Jesus Christ, who journeyed to the cross to give you hope, walk with you this day and in the days ahead to bless you and guide you and help you to share his love in the world. Amen.